we have been doing a series for two months now on the Lord's Prayer, and um, one of the really cool exercises, activities, things that you can do to interact with the Lord's Prayer is to recognize that it may um, also have been given as a pattern for how to pray. And so I've created, well, I ran across this exercise a while ago. I created a sheet for it so we can do it, um, where we rephrase the words of the Lord's Prayer and put them in our own words. And my hope is that um, if you're willing to fill this out and bring it back to me next week, we can maybe make a patchwork Lord's Prayer of harbor words of how we would pray it. And so I'm going to pass out these sheets. If you would be willing to do that, to interact with it, um, feel free to take one. And if you're not, don't feel bad. Just pass it on and, um, and we'll keep moving on. Um, this is the last one in our series. We, um, it's been quite the journey. And it's reminded me of, of um, kind of taking jaunts with my dad. My dad was quite the outdoorsman. He was also a Boy Scout uh, leader. And so I grew up in the Boy Scout troop with him, going and doing hikes on a regular basis. And um, my dad is, was also kind of the optimist, so it didn't really matter if the weather was bad. But we would still go hiking. And it was going to be a good time, darn it. Um, <laughs> This led to a number of hikes, some of which uh, were in cloudy, drudgery weather. We've all probably seen a few of those in the Northwest where you are trudging through the mud and it's cloudy and you're staring at your feet and it's one foot in front of the other and then you get done and go, well, I made it. Um, other hikes, sunny day, it's beautiful. And I noticed when we did those, there was like joking and people are playing and there's better conversations and people have their eyes up. And this last phrase of the Lord's Prayer is an opportunity for us to lift up our eyes, to get a little bit more bounce in our step, to walk a little bit stronger. Um, our, uh, my, my central kind of thesis, if I was to really try to take what the scripture says, is it's what Jesus says when he says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And having it abundantly does not look like trudging through each day like this to me. It's when the Lord gets a hold of us and there's a, there's a new a new life, a new spring to our step. And I think this last phrase um, is a good way to get at it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. That's what we're going to be looking at. So, um, I kind of think of them as viewpoints along, along the way on our little journey of a hike. Uh, that first look out, thine is the kingdom. And it is a reminder, um, and it's one that I think we need, that God is still in control. That he's in charge, that this is his kingdom, and he's going to set things right. Um, when you go to a restaurant, and then you order, and it comes like super late, and super cold, and the waiter's really rude, uh, and you're highly disappointed with the experience, uh, one thing you can do is you can ask to see the manager. And if the manager is a good manager, then you know what he's going to do. He's going to have a conversation. Maybe he'll give you a, a break on your bill. But, but there's this reassurance that he will give you that things are going to get set right. Um, it's an important thing in a world where things can sometimes go sideways. And it's easy for us to lose track of that. For us to think that the world is just what we make it. I want to bring us to... Mark chapter 12. It's a, it's a hard word from Jesus, um, but it's a parable, and I want to read it for us. Mark 12, 1 through 12. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press. He built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of their vineyard. But they seized him, and they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. And then he sent another servant to them, and they struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. And he sent many others, some of whom they beat, and others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. And he sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. 
So they took him and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and he will kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Having you read this passage of scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And then the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and they went away. Um, it echoes what John said at the beginning of his Gospels. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Um, part of why they didn't receive him is they had lost track of the fact that the kingdom was actually God's. They started to think the kingdom was theirs. And as I've been thinking about this and reflecting on this, um, I'm reminded of Christina and I's first apartment. We, we were so excited. We got our own place. Uh, it was right over actually on 133rd in Greenwood, a little apartment. And we got to decorate it ourselves. We, we moved into it right after we got married. It was our, it was our first our place. And um, man, it was just, it, it, it felt so good to have a place of our own. And then we got a phone call out of the middle of nowhere uh, where the manager said, hey, I'm gonna come visit. I need to do a check on the place. And he walks in and he looks on the wall, and I'm pretty sure there was some mold growing on the wall, but he's like, you've been burning candles too close to the walls. There's, there's streaks appearing on the walls. You guys, you guys need to take care of that. You need to, you need to clean it up. And um, when he visited us, it reminded me, oh yeah, I don't own this place. I'm a caretaker for it. Um, that's the relationship. And on the one hand, there's a little bit of a nudge, a challenge, a kick in the butt, if you will. Uh, are we good caretakers of what God has given us? Are we good caretakers of the world around us? Are we good takers, caretakers of the people that God has put in our path? Um, but on the other hand, there's a really good thing to renting. When stuff breaks, you don't have to fix it. You call somebody and you go, you know what? The washing machine's broken. Can you get that done right away? And hopefully they don't put you off for an entire week and a half while the furnace is broken and you freeze. Um, but one of the beautiful things in this prayer, thine is the kingdom, is the reminder that God will set things right. He is in the process of fixing it. And no matter how broken things might get, no matter how broken our lives get, no matter what choices we've made, no matter how messed up the situation, God's got this. can bring it back. And he will. And we get to be a part of it. And that's a very, very cool thing to think. What would the world be like when it's set right? And to think that we get to be a part of that story. Um, the second spot we go to in this Lord's Prayer. Um, Thine is the power. I want to read another story for, for you from Scripture. Mark 4. 35. The Pittmans can give me bookmarks, but it doesn't mean I'll use them. <laughs> All right. I learned my lesson. Here we go. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, and just as he was in the boat, there were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up. He rebuked the wind. He said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves would obey him? I always wonder if they were more scared of the wind and the waves than they were of the fact that they were sitting with somebody who could tell the wind and the waves to stop. Um, but where is Jesus when things are stormy, when your boat is pitching and you're holding on for dear life? Where is Jesus? Doesn't he even care? And there he is. He's, he's 
sleeping? Why was he sleeping? Why do we even have to wake him up? Isn't he worried? Well, you don't have to be worried if you can tell the waves to be still. Um, Jesus, it's not that he doesn't care. It's that he has tremendous power. It's not a power greater than his own. And then he asked the disciples, where's your faith? You have little faith. Why, why don't you have faith? Why don't, why don't you trust that God has the power to handle this? And when you were in the waves or whether you're marveling at the fact that you just made it through some waves, whichever way it is, it's an incredibly reassuring thing to know that God's power can turn situations around Thine is the power as a reminder that we are not on our own. These were seasoned fishermen. They should know how to sail this boat, but some storms are bigger than they are. And in some ways, it's a blessing when we realize in some aspect of our lives that we can't do this. Because it makes us turn to God and go, Oh, I actually need you. We were not made to control our lives. We were not made to be in control. There's a God who wants to give us power as we walk through our lives. And when we walk with that power, our head gets lifted up. When you're frustrated, you can say, God, give me patience. And out of nowhere, you might find it. The Holy Spirit's good like that. When you're stressed, God, I need peace. When you're at a loss, man, God, I am I'm powerless. I'm doing all I can, but I need you. It's an incredible prayer. We really have two choices. We can live on our power, and the way that we do that is we gather all that we have and we apply it to the problems and the challenges of our lives, and um, hopefully we have enough to muster to get over the challenge and we might scrape through. Or we recognize the one who made everything has the power to tell winds and waves to be still and say, God guide me through it. Your power is what I need. Um, and when we do that, we suddenly have a much more free and powerful existence. Thine is the power, is the reminder to lean into God. He's there for you. You don't have to do it on your own. One more little summit. It's, it's when you're at the tiredest of your journey. When you're coming around that last bend and you're, you're almost near the summit, and you need something to give you that little push that you can dig down and, and find. Um, thine is the glory. Uh, classical music trivia. Ready? Johann Sebastian Bach, on all of his church pieces, and some of his secular ones, wrote at the bottom, S-D-G. Does anybody know what S-D-G stands for? I'm betting that our classical music expert. What's it stand for? Yes. Solo Deo Gloria. To the glory of God alone. In other words, don't praise me for this piece of music. It was God's that he gave it. It's giving the credit away. Um, that at first sounds like a negative. Give God the credit for all the stuff I've done in my life. Uh, is he taking it from me? That seems weird. Um, but the problem with taking credit, I've found is that then we start to think the weight of everything is on us to accomplish. Huh? I've had a journey in my life with, with the whole giving offerings thing that um, at some point a shift happened in my mind and I was like, God gave me what I have and he asked me to give a little bit back and when I do this, it's a reminder to me that God is uh, providing me more than enough. And it's incredibly relaxing. And now the crazy thing is, in the seasons when I have not done that, I start to get stressed because I start to think I have to manage everything. Um, same is absolutely true in my relationships. When I rely on God, I go, man, look at how God's blessed me. And when I don't, I find myself going, how do I get to be a better person? And how do I be a better husband? How do I be a better friend? And why aren't things going according to the way I want In uh, Rick Warren's book, 40 Days of, of Purpose, uh, I love the first words of it, the first chapter. It's not about you. That's it. 
It's not about this life that we are living. It's not actually about us and what we can accomplish. There is something incredibly freeing about recognizing that. There is a bigger story, and it's God's. I, my dad uh, also had a, my dad had a side gig, and it was to paint apartments. And he would take me out painting sometimes with him. And it was my job, because I was a wee little Chris, it was my job to paint the bottom trim. He would tape it all up so that I really couldn't screw it up. And then it was my job to use my little brush to paint the trim along the bottom so that he could do the big rollers and the sprayers and all that other stuff. And um, I would come home and legitimately say at the end of a day, Mom, we painted seven apartments today. <laughs> Me with my little brush painted seven apartments that day. <laughs> well, my dad did most of the painting, but we painted it. Um, when we take the glory, we lose track of the fact that God is actually doing a whole lot of the work. He does all the heavy lifting. Did you watch any of the Olympics? Um, okay, I have a confession. There are two things of the Olympics that I'm especially fond of. Figure skating. I know, I'm weird. Um, curling. Why is it that I picked the two weirdest sports for me to be huge fans of? But this year there was a ton of hype for <laughs> figure skating for a guy by the name of Nathan Chen. He is a U.S. figure skater, and he's known as the, the king of quads because he can jump and do four spins in the air before he lands again, and he does it again and again and again and again. And he was expected to win the gold medal this year. And he went into his short program and absolutely collapsed. He was tentative. He fell multiple times. Everyone said, this is the worst we've ever seen him. And when they interviewed him afterwards, he said, you know, I was worried about what medal I was gonna get. I was worried about not letting everybody down. All the stress of the Olympics was on him. He got 17th place after the short program, which meant there was no chance to get a medal. So when the pressure wasn't on him to accomplish it all himself, and he didn't need the glory anymore because there was none to be had, he went out and did his long program He's the first person to ever do six quad jumps in a single program. He got the highest score that has ever been given in Olympic history for his second one. And it brought him up to fifth place. Um, all because the stress of mine is the glory was gone. I don't think God actually wants to take away the glory of our accomplishments. When he says mine is the glory and asks us to give him the glory. What he wants to do is remind us that he can do the heavy lifting. We don't need the credit. The air is too thin if we go about life that way. We won't be able to walk well. Um, one of my favorite books is The Life You've Always Wanted by John R. Burke. And in it, he has a chapter that um, is beautifully titled, and it's called Appropriate Smallness. It's recognizing what spot you have. You have a spot. You can do some things. <coughs> But it's appropriate smallness is recognizing the bigness of God. I want to read for you um, some guidance that Paul gave. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. I don't know if I put it in there. No, I didn't. All right. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, an appropriate smallness Value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. It's a beautiful way to live when we don't worry about ourselves and we just make ourselves useful to the people around us. When we can look at the end of the day and go, you know what, I'm not that big of a deal. And when our value doesn't come from needing to be a big deal, but it comes from God recognizing us and saying, I love you enough that I would give you my son. You're mine. You're my beloved child. That's where beautiful value comes from. And then you have nothing to prove. You can get lifted up. Jesus tells a story about when you show up at a party. It's pretty good advice. Um, he says, don't go and sit at the seat of honor. Don't go and put yourself right next to the host. Uh, because the host might go, you know what? Sorry, that seat's reserved for somebody else. I need you to go down at the other end of the table way far away. And it'll be really embarrassing. Instead, 
Put yourself at the end of the table. Be humble. Don't need the glory. And then what you might find is the host goes, Hey, there's my good friend. What's he doing down at the end of the table? Come on up here. Sit at the head of the table with me. God lifts us up. We don't have to lift ourselves up. There's a saying, pride comes before the fall. And the recipe for avoiding that fall, don't let yourself get up on a pedestal. There's no need to be there. I want to close this uh, series with the words of Psalm 121. I think it's a beautiful way of describing what it is that God's inviting us to in the Lord's Prayer, especially in this last phrase. It's also one of my favorite psalms. So. Okay, Pittman's. I'll use the bookmarks. <laughs> All right. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He won't let your foot slip. He watches over you. He doesn't sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun can't harm you by the day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Is the reminder that you are in the hands of a God who loves you and who rules over the world and has plenty of power and strength for you as you go along your way. Let him have the weight of life. Let him have the glory so that we can be free. It's funny, when you get up to the top of a hike, um, oftentimes you get a better perspective. Things look a little different. Maybe you can see your house in the distance and you go, oh, that's my whole neighborhood. Um, so often in my life, I feel like I get stuck in the weeds. Um, I'm walking along and I'm, I'm trying to make my every step. And the Lord's Prayer is an invitation to to ascend to a higher place and look at it and realize there's a bigger picture going on. And it's a beautiful view from where God is. And so it's an invitation to do what we always do, which is to trust, to live according to his power, to let him walk with us. I love John, uh, I think it's 14, 15, the vine and the branches. He says, uh, remain in me and I will remain in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But with me, you will bear much fruit. And it's an invitation to recognize that our life does not come from us. And that he can do a whole lot more than we can do. So let's pray. God, this is your world. We get to live in it. Thanks for your generosity to us. It's comforting to know that you are in charge. We are sorry for the times that we have thought that we were. God, it's your kingdom. God, we need your power. If we're going to truly live abundant lives, if we're not going to just live out of our own strength, we need you to walk beside us. So God, in those moments when we are tempted to take on the power ourselves and to do things our way, remind us of you. Bring us back to you. We need you. Let us never lose track of the fact that we need you. And God, we give you the credit. We give you the glory. Everything is yours, and you have given us much. So who are we to take credit for? Thanks for doing the heavy lifting in our lives.